my studio is in the west side of Missoula um, by the rail yards, and there's always loud banging from the trains um, directly behind the building. Um, I share a space with a band. Um, they're called Junior. They're an all-girl kind of country sad girl rock band um, and they're really good friends of mine um, and so we're constantly collapsing and colliding into one of one another um, trying to be in the space together um, it keeps our rent really cheap which is nice um, and yeah so that's the space that i'm in uh, in the past four years of living in missoula i had one studio and i've worked out of a garage um, but this is the most consistent space that i've had since moving to montana um, and this space is purely like a site of production like i as i'm making work i'm not thinking about this space i'm thinking about the space and imagining my relationship to the space that this work is going to be in and so many of my projects and exhibitions are about that imagination, imagining, um, and kind of conceptual curation of my work into that space um, or collaboration with the community that that space occupies. Um, so as I work in here, I'm not actually really aware of it. Like I'm aware of like the table that I'm on, but I'm, I'm not considering it anything more than a tool. Um, I like to think that most of my work is done like at home, um, like reading or watching movies or like in that space of lying in bed, but I'm not asleep yet. Um, I'm often thinking through ideas and projects and taking notes um, as I'm kind of taking in the world within my apartment. I would say six eighths of my time as an artist is thinking and then two eighths of my time I'm gonna break it down that much but um, so little of my time is actual production and um, when I'm here it's maybe two to four hours of just constant work um. like art that's really confusing right and um because it's confusing or doesn't give answers that kind of stands in opposition in my mind to what we expect out of the world we're, we're on social media we're on the internet we want information and answers to everything all the time and then to have to stare at something and ask questions and slow down our being in front of that and wonder and wonder wondering is huge um I don't think that artists are essential workers. I think that art has a history and a trajectory within humankind that's really important and should be cultivated and celebrated. But um, I don't think I don't think that art has the power to solve cultural and economic and social problems. But I think. The power of art is um, rooted in the idea of shifting mindsets and shifting ways of being and finding poetics with objects in space. And that can help folks learn how to solve problems that, um, that could save humankind, that can shift how, how we be in the world. Um, so in that way, you know, I don't think art's essential, but I think that it is um, a necessary part of the human condition um, and our history. I mean, it's what makes us human at the end of the day. So I'm from Ohio, from Southern Ohio, um, Cincinnati, Ohio. And I grew up in a working class family and um, had no aspirations to go to college or go to school after, after high school, I suppose. Um, 
I found myself managing a pizza joint when I was 18 and taking community uh, college courses and took an art class and decided that's what I wanted to do. Um, so I went to art school. I took out a bunch of student loans, which I am still paying off and uh, went to art school, got out of art school, worked at a bronze foundry in Cincinnati um, and eventually got into graduate school in Portland. Uh, after graduate school, I moved to New York City um, for a residency that lasted six months. Uh, and I worked for a couple galleries, worked for a couple artists, um, and was working as an artist myself. And then I got back into a residency in Portland and moved back to Portland. And I stayed in Portland for a decade, um, working as an artist and working for galleries and artists there. Um, I ran two galleries while I was in Portland supporting my arts community. Um, and by the end of 2017, I was really burned out of my life in Portland um, and was looking for a change. And my partner had moved out to Missoula. And so I moved out here. Yeah, my yeah. grandfather was a steel worker uh, in Northern Ohio. Um, I feel a relationship to industry and the way that I I tend to make work and conceptualize my practice as, as, a, as a worker rather than yeah, as an artist. I, I mean, I think the reason I went to art school was to try to get past what I perceived as my, uh, the limitations, the economic and social limitations of where I grew up. Um, and being an artist or conceiving myself as an artist, um, allowed me that, that kind of radical freedom uh, of thinking differently. Um. And I'm very much the artist that walks into a gallery and looks at the white wall and says, okay, what's behind that white wall? What's the architecture of that building? Oh. What is that neighborhood that that building is in? What is the economy behind that building and that space? And so space starts to expand for me and I'm not stuck on the artwork, but I'm stuck on, you know, kind of the con the multi contexts that are functioning behind the artwork. So, uh -huh. so that's how art functions for me. Originally I proposed a show in Basin that were just square paintings. Um, the reason I had wanted to just do squares um, was when you have a square painting, it no longer implies a landscape or a portrait based on the orientation of a rectangle um, that's collapsed into, you know, a square essentially. Um, however, I think that that space has a lot of interesting architecture in it, um, and the different shaped canvases don't have to be presented on the wall at sixty you know, inches center, like they can move around the space. Um. that space is so dark and heavy with its history and to put something white or really light in there uh, expands the space in some way. I mean, it, it kind of mirrors back the architecture, but provides a different way of viewing, I think, and they become thresholds or windows or, or something, um, but they can't really be viewed from in the jail cells. They can only be viewed from in the holding space. So that's interesting too. Yeah, so that's what I was thinking about. I, I think I, I, I was looking to mirror back some of the architecture of that space, but also to open it up a little architecturally. Yeah, poetically, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, the, the paintings were and they have about 20 layers of paint, of pigment and paint. Um, each monochrome has a different color. 
and it's selected based on the graffiti that's on the walls already. So just using a color that's on the wall to make an aesthetic decision to start the painting process. Um, and then after a few layers of getting that monochrome painting kind of as solid as possible, I started whiting it out. Um, I find it really interesting on graffiti when people try to white out graffiti and these textures and shapes start to come through. Mm -hmm. So that's an action that's happening in that space too. So I wanted to play with that action and just have a wall painting essentially. Mm -hmm. um, but it took like 15 layers of paint of white acrylic paint to really get past that tone and to really white it back out. So wow. um, yeah, so that's it. And what I was thinking about so much of the graffiti is, you know, chalk or white paint as well. Well, first when I walked in there, I was just puzzled. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what? Yeah. What is this guy up to? But, yeah. you know, going back mm -hmm. more than one time, and what what I got was this beautiful sense of those white pieces just kind of floating in the air yeah. and making this, making the space Pushes. bigger. Yeah, yeah. I felt a, a really nice... Uh, contrast to the, uh, yeah, the jail, uh -huh. uh, this this feel that uh oh maybe there is another way, maybe there's a way out of here, maybe there's sure. whether that be imaginative or yeah. physical, yeah, You're right, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I think that the idea of confinement is really Jenny and I were talking about this, but confinement is really important to my thought process when making work and the way that I orientate myself in the world and. Um, whether it be fear of ending up in prison or ending up in a situation that I can't control, how does one in their mind find a route out of that confinement? Um, and those are fears and other, you know, societal pressures or whatever. Um, for me, coming from the Midwest and feeling like I only had a couple options within the area that I come from for a future um, and finding a route past all of that, past that socioeconomic confinement so you know the the jail having the opportunity to install in a jail was kind of like this one-to-one -one, like okay like i understand this space uh -huh. not uh -huh. physically but psychically and i get to install in it now and i get to leave it open for people to come in and out of there's not kind of the barriers and the pressures of a white wall gallery or a for-profit gallery that the art has to live in. So kind of the luxuriness of art gets to dissipate and the art gets to live on the wall as just that art as a poetic statement. I'm not, I'm not the type of artist that goes into a studio for eight hours and has a relationship with a surface and can move material around. I have to have workflows. I have to have materials to work on and I have to understand where the painting is gonna be exhibited or which direction it's moving outside of the studio um, without without that context i'm i'm somewhat paralyzed um, and i've embraced that space of non-work and that's where like reading writing watching movies um, has become really important to me so I, I feel like a good portion of my life is my career um, not as an artist, but working in an adjacent field and then living my life with my partner. And then I find time from there to be in the studio to accomplish very specific tasks um, that go towards uh, projects and exhibitions. And I've been lucky enough to cultivate friendships outside of the state. And in the past year and a half, um, that's been true within the state. And it's been really exciting to feel like I have a regional and a local community. Um, but I, I would say the phone calls, the meetings that I have, um, the drinks, the hikes that I do with other artists and arts adjacent folks, like I said, um, um, I've gotten to the point that I, I am willing to trust like over the course of months and years that space will uh, space will reveal itself through these connections.
I'm often thinking about my relationship with space. Um, with the jail cell and basin, you know, what's important to me, and this is what I discovered moving to Montana, coming from Southern Ohio, I have no idea about um, ranching, about copper mines, about being a cowboy in the West. Like I, I, I have no relationship to that. What I have a relationship to is the history of labor. Um, I understand unions uh, are important to Montana. Well, unions are important to Southern Ohio. Um, and I understand my relationship in that history um, or where I can place myself with that history. So when I look at a jail cell in Basin, Montana, I see that history. I, I understand that Basin is really close to Butte, which, was a big, which is still a big mining town. Um, you know, and the IWW was there for so many years agitating for workers' rights. And so, you know, I start to imagine that activists, union organizers ended up in that jail space. And there is a direct relationship then to my ideas of, you know, workers' rights and all of that. I'm within that trajectory in history, even if that space is collapsing and in total disarray, I feel like that history is carried. Um, and so, that makes me want to be in a space is I can understand that history and relate it to my own, my own experience. Um. Um, I'm really interested and intrigued by uh, what I'll call degree zero painting, um, one color paintings, monochrome paintings, uh, paintings that appear as ready-made objects. Um, and there's a rich history of that within modernism um, and a little postmodernism. Uh, but it goes all the way back to the Russian constructivist, um, Kazimir Malevich and you know Alexander Rodchenko looking at the base level of painting, color, surface, you know, mark, and questioning if that's enough um, to consider what an object is within the aesthetic realm. Um, the jail cell and basin is full of graffiti and dirt, so there's already this relationship to surface that's interesting. Um, there is what I would call pedestrian painting that's occurring by travelers traveling through. Um, so the question in my mind then is what does it mean to bring in a uh, what appears a blank as a blank surface into that space can someone come in and make a mark to that um, can the work be stolen because it's a public space um, in my mind that starts to collapse kind of the the higher the hierarchy of meaning that western art history has taught us and i like that conversation so um so that's why monochrome painting um they feel complicated and cheap to me at the same time um and keep me on task to complete work um, so if you hadn't been to the space before today um, installed in that space were three white monochrome paintings with nothing on them kind of blank canvases um, pure white paintings and a wheat paste photo in the back jail cell with a um, red triangle painting that has disappeared since. So as far as the space, um, I really like to operate artistically kind of in what I call a theater of relations where the the audience isn't necessarily invited but not not invited to participate with the work. I like to give very subtle clues or hints of what you could do in the space um, by not really intervening with telling what, what people to do. So simply leaving the door unlocked. What does that do? Um, it allows the work to be moved uh, or weathered through the weather, um, bodies can come into the space and interact with it, um, and it really allows me to reorganize kind of my mind around the, um, what I'd call like the luxury value of art. Um, 
it's not on a white wall. The preciousness of art is being taken away by installing it in that space. And if you do that, um, do we as a community or as individuals get to understand objects in a different light? Um, and that feels really important. So leaving the door unlocked, inviting participation through just that very minor action. Um, I had an expectation that something could happen. Uh, oh, it's getting there. Interesting. Oh, I was like, that one's off, but it's on a rock. Oh yeah, <laughs> it is like, on a rock. Off about it. It's so funny. So this one's still in its original spot, but yeah, it's pretty ripped up. We really slashed it. Yeah. Now we're missing some trash everywhere. Wow. Okay. They really went at it. Yeah. Is that a signature? Yeah, there's something in Carissa Carey. And it's like I gave someone an opportunity to make their own work. Yeah. And then there's writing down here. Oh, what does that say? Love. Matthew from Abby. It's kind of sweet. Um, you know, as an artist, a laborer, um, seeing slash canvases, the first reaction is like, oh no, that's a lot of hours and time. Um, but it's exciting too, because I'm, I'm divorcing myself of this idea of vandalism, um, and I'm trying to renegotiate what, what the value of art can be. Um, and so for an adult or teenagers to come into that space, um, or kids, and to have a, have a moment to interact is really exciting um, through a very small in invitation. I also think a lot of those marks are probably aggressive, and I like to think about, well, okay, they've happened on this threshold and maybe that aggression is being taken by that threshold and not playing out somewhere else in the world. And maybe that's an important moment to recognize as well. So it's quite exciting to think about. Um, when the emails came in, it was like, oh fuck, like that was a lot of time and labor, you know, and effort. And kind of, you know, if I step back and look at that, it's like, man, okay, those are some ruined paintings and that's a bummer. But at the same time, what's occurring to those canvases are um, what I'm always trying to accomplish with art. I'm like trying to pose questions and I'm trying to create a situation or a theater of relations that suddenly my authorship as an artist dis dissipates. Yeah. You know, there's not a, there's not a big A artist in the space anymore there's just objects that can be played with mm -hmm. um, so if i can divorce myself from the labor and the time and the big a artist that in my ego in my head yeah yeah and if i step outside of that it's like okay an action has happened in this space some of some of it's aggressive and weird fine i was a teenager i was a kid i totally get it um but this theater is evolving. There's this space of play now um, that I get to interact in, either through responding to or doing nothing with. Both of those are reactions and I get to operate in that context with a community that's played in that space. That seems potentially exciting to me. Um, so my feelings evolved from like, oh man, to like, I need to sit with this, to okay, this is actually functioning this is functioning in the way that I envision art functioning. And it might be violent, it might be aggressive, but is it vandalism? I don't think it is. It's creating another context for the work. And that, yeah. that seems important and interesting to me. Mm -hmm. So so I feel like, you know, this work in Basin is kind of in context and in relationship to that work where mm -hmm. this theater is created and someone come, comes in and disrupts that theater and reorientates it. Um, 
and it forces me to have a different relationship with the object as well. So, right. yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's weird. Well, it's, it's, it's wonderful to yeah. me. I mean, we place so much value on the, on the preciousness uh -huh. of objects. Yeah. Uh, when really, what is it? It's a little pile of material. It's material. Some kind. Yeah. Or other. And that material and is going to fade away. Yeah. It's going to turn to dust. Yeah. You know? So is it the material or is it the action, you know, that holds power, that holds meaning or context for the viewer, for the artist? And, and I don't know, but it's an interesting question. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, did anyone notice the photograph on the wall that was all torn up and tattered? So that's an artwork that I placed in the space to be permanent. Um, I wanted to have a, not a reaction, but I wanted to play off what was already happening in the space. And wheat pasting is, you know, a, a strategy of graffiti and of advertisement, permanent advertisement. So um, I made a very simple decision to wheat paste a photograph. These photographs were um, taken on a point and shoot camera when I first moved to Montana, when I couldn't find a job and was driving a, as a delivery driver. And I would purpose, purposefully take wrong turns and document where those wrong turns would end up um, as kind of a way to uh, produce a, a, a non-capital, a, a labor that isn't involved in capital under the or in the product okay as a way to not generate money while I'm generating money as a, as a step to combat the fact that I was a low paid worker um, and so in that way I'm retaining some of my autonomy um, as a human being um, by taking wrong turns and documenting those wrong turns um, the photographs are cheap they're on a point and shoot and they're going to be they're going to be um, printed on bond paper and wheat pasted to the walls. So then there's a relationship. Um, there's a relationship to the graffiti because wheat paste comes out of a tradition of street art and, and graffiti. Um, so there's a nice inside out relationship that's occurring um, with those works um, in the same way that the monochromes inside potentially could be portals for looking outside like the windows that are in that space. I have this like fantasy that I'm gonna take those three works and just put them up as a mural in a white space gallery and claim it as like my own artwork. So again, playing with authorship. Um, well, so um, there is also a red painting. It was a red triangle called Red Patch. Um, and that disappeared. At one point I got an image from Nan. It was like on the floor. It was kind of lovely. It was like around dust and leaves and on the floor and then it disappeared completely. And it's really quite lovely to think about that work traveling down I-15 or going into a house in the community or ending up in the landfill. You know, like it, where does that work live now? Um, and how does my value with an artist, again, as an artist, um, come into play with that work um, now that it's been taken? Like that. Poetic and nice, I don't know. I kind of like it. Yeah. I mean, I feel like you just gave this person an exhibition now by hanging it up. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, give the teenagers their exhibition that they've been wanting. See, that's nice. Wow. Huh. I wonder where the red painting lives now. You have to speed into the dark. Past where your headlights work. 